When we spread goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity to all beings, we're said to be developing a sublime abiding. The Pali term is Brahma Vihara, literally the dwelling places of Brahmas. We're trying to take our human mind which can be very partial about who it wishes well to, and lift it to a level of the Brahmas, where they wish well to everybody. But if you just do the Brahma Viharas, that's as far as it takes you, to a very high level of being. But it's not release. As the Buddha said, the Brahma Viharas on their own do not lead to dispassion. They don't lead to unbinding. But if you combine them with the factors for awakening, they can lead to unbinding. What this means is you should develop them with strong concentration, and also you use your discernment to analyze what you're doing, to analyze what you're wishing, in a way that leads to dispassion. A good example is the development of empathetic joy. It's of the Brahma Viharas. It's the one that doesn't get talked about much. And actually, it's one of the harder ones to do. It lifts your mind to a higher level than simply goodwill or even compassion. And it's good to think about why. Thinking about why gives you a sense of how you can go beyond just being happy for other people when they're happy. You have to think about, are there people out there for whom it's difficult to appreciate their happiness? And there are two types of people that might come to mind. First are those with whom you feel to be in competition. In other words, they have something you want, but you don't have it. They beat you to it. It's going to be very difficult not to feel resentment in cases like that. So you have to analyze why. You come back down to the sense of self that you build around the kind of happiness you want, the image you have of yourself in comparison with other people. And it's very small-minded not to be happy for other people, and even in situations like that. So it forces you to look at yourself how you define yourself and with regard to other people, what your attitudes toward happiness are, what your attitudes toward good fortune are. The Buddha has you reflect. When you see someone who has the good fortune you don't have, that you've been there before. You created the karma to enjoy those things. Now that karma has shown its results and gone away. If you want those results again, you've got to create the karma to create them, bring them back. But in the meantime, why be envious of those who have what you used to have and what you would like to have? It's part of human life that there are ups and downs. Sometimes your down coincides with their up. So why be envious? Why be resentful? Is that the kind of self you want to nurture, one that's envious or resentful? This kind of reflection helps you look back on your whole idea of how you create a sense of self, and ways in which you can really be unskillful. So this is one of the ways in this reflection helps give rise to dispassion. Another type of person for whom it's difficult to feel empathetic joy are those who have good fortune, those who have happiness, and either they did something unskillful to gain it, or they're abusing their positions of power and influence. But 
But here, too, you have to think. They did the causes someplace back in the past to gain that kind of happiness. But now look at what they've got. Not only is the happiness they've gained impermanent, and the things they've done to gain it are unskillful, at least right in the present moment, but the happiness doesn't prevent them from acting in unskillful ways. This shows you that happiness is not all that safe. We may aspire to happiness of one kind or another. But it's important that we think about the implications of what if we gain that happiness and we abuse it? We're putting ourselves in a dangerous position. That blessing we have, ayutwa no sukang balang, long life, beauty, happiness, and strength. Those things can be dangerous. Long life can be pretty miserable toward the end. Beauty, there are a lot of people who abuse their beauty and get abused because of their beauty. Happiness, if it's worldly happiness, it's, it's no protection. And even strength, some people abuse their strength. So this helps you reflect on what kind of happiness would be safe. It forces you to have some equanimity to the way that kar karma works itself out. Sometimes you work for happiness, and by the time it comes, you've changed. You're a different kind of person. Originally, you thought you would use your happiness for good purposes, but something's happened in the meantime. As for people who are happy now, who have good fortune now, you have to be equanimous about it. But then from equanimity, you move into a sense of dispassion. You realize that if you want happiness, it's really true, really solid. It has to be more than just worldly happiness. This sense of dismay is what gets you on the path. So as you're practicing the Brahma Viharas, it's good to think about them. An empathetic joy, as I said, is a good test case. After all, you say, I want everybody, everybody to be happy, I want everybody to be happy. When well, you see someone who's actually happy, well, this is what it looks like. Exactly what kind of happiness are you wishing for, for yourself and for other beings? It forces you to reflect. The only kind of happiness that's safe is what the Buddha calls noble happiness. The only search for happiness that's safe is the noble search. So if you combine the practice of the Brahma Viharas with that fact of awakening that's called analysis of qualities, it's the discernment faculty in the factors for awakening. You go beyond simply trying to create a happy state of mind. You start reflecting on the nature of happiness. And that's when the practice begins to lead beyond something that's simply ordinary. It inclines the mind to look for happiness as noble, true, harmless, safe. So that when you're enjoying the happiness of others, that's the happiness that you find is most enjoyable. and most worthy of pursuit.